In this video, we're going to take a look at how to use the new and beloved Top Bar Plus version 3. If you've never heard of Top Bar Plus, it is a neat module that allows you to add widgets or icons along the top of the screen that matches the style of the default Roblox UI. This recently released version made by Forever HD adds support for the new Roblox UI that has been rolling out to more and more users. And V3 is also backwards compatible to any players who still have the old Roblox UI. There are a lot of features and functions to go over for Top Bar Plus, and we're going to take a look at all of them. Please note, as of the recording of this video, I'm using version 3.0.2, and there are still some issues with Top R Plus, which is expected. V3 came out not that long ago, so there's still going to be a few bugs that Forever HD will need to iron out in the future. To get started with Top Bar Plus, all we need to do is require the icon module to create new widgets on the top bar of the screen. So wherever you have your icon module script located, you're going to need to require it. I just have mine in replicated storage, so I'm going to require it from this local script that is inside of starter player scripts. And then once you have gotten your icon module required, then you can go ahead and use the dot new constructor that exists within this module to create new icon objects. And I'm going to go ahead and store this inside a variable. I'm just going to call it icon. And this is going to be my new icon that's going to display on the screen. And as you can see, as we play test the game, here is a new 32 by 32 pixel icon that has appeared on the top left. It's blank because there's nothing in it. There's no labels. There's nothing. But we are able to select it and deselect it, which is going to be firing some events that we'll take a look at a little bit later. Now, do note that I have modified my module slightly to include types. So that way, when I refer to my icon, I can see all of the functions that belong to it. I'm pretty sure types are going to be added to top bar plus sometime in the future, but I just did it for the sake of this video. So it's easy for me to see all the functions and autofill them. Now, the first function we can go ahead and take a look at is going to be the set name function. I'm just going to pass a name here of like Bob. And all this is going to do is just set the name of the widget instance itself. And then this is going to be useful when you need to grab different widgets based on a particular name. So since I have this icon or this widget set to the name of Bob, when I go and use a function inside of the icon module itself, which is the function of get icon, I can pass that name here and get it back from this function if an icon exists with this particular name. This function is purely for identification purposes and doesn't really serve much other use other than that. Now the next function we have here is called get instance or collective, which will return an instance based on the name you provide that's inside of the widget UI itself for all the instances that make up the widget. So if you wanna grab a specific thing out of there for some reason, if you wanna manipulate it in some way, then you can do so by using this function. So actually, let me go ahead and get rid of that and then let's play test the game. And then let's go ahead and head over to our player GUI folder and let's go ahead and take a look at the top bar. And I believe we're going to have to go to standard and then we're going to go to the left. And as you can see, here is our Bob widget. Here's the frame and then there's some other stuff in here such as the icon button itself. There's a gradient for it, a cornering. Here is a menu for it. And then there's a whole bunch of different instances that make up this widget. Now, if you wanted to grab any of these particular instances, then that's what you were going to use the get instance or collective function for. As an example, I can go ahead and get the instance or collective. Let's say I want to get the menu and then let's go ahead and actually print that out inside of the console. And if we go and play test our game and we take a look, as you can see, we got a table returned back to us referring to that particular instance, which is menu. The next function we have is called modify theme, which is not autofilling for some reason. But what we do here is this gives us the ability to modify the theme of our button in any way we want. And we can do so by passing a table to this function. And this table has to contain some information of what we would like to modify. If we take a look at the documentation for top bar plus, it says to modify the theme, you can modify the appearance by doing modify theme and passing modifications. Modifications can either be a single array describing a change or a collection of these arrays. For example, both the following are valid. So here we want to modify the theme of the icon label and we want to change the text size and set it to 16. While we can also change multiple different properties at the same time, for example, we want to modify the widget instance, change its minimum width and set that to 290, or we can go ahead and manipulate the icon corners and set the corner radius to a new UDIM. It says a modification array has four components, the name, property, value, and an optional icon state. 
So with the name, it says this can be widget, which is the icon container frame, the name of an instance within the widget, such as the icon gradient, the icon spot, the menu, all of those different instances that we saw. And it says a collective, the value of an attribute called collective applied to some instances. This enables them to be acted upon all at once. For example, all of the icon corners inside of your widget. The second is going to be the property to modify. It says a property from the instance, like the name, background, color, text, etc. Or if the property doesn't exist, an attribute of that property name will be set on the instance and then thirdly we need the value so the value you want the property to become you can pass strings colors whatever and then this last optional thing we can pass is an icon state and it says this determines when the modification is applied so we can apply this particular modification to our widget during specific states like if the icon is selected or deselected we can go ahead and do that so let's go ahead and modify the theme of let's say the widget and the property we would like to modify is, let's say we want to modify the size and let's set that to a new UDIM2 and let's do from offset. And let's say I want to make it longer. So let's do like 500 pixels along the X axis. And then for the Y offset, I think the default is 32. So we're just going to leave it like that. And then let me get rid of this print statement. And as you can see, now we have a new widget that is 500 pixels across. And it looks like the button area actually didn't update. So I believe we only manipulated the widget itself. And I guess the height is actually a little bit taller than 32 pixels. So I think the documentation needs to be fixed in that regard. But as you can see, now we have modified this particular instance inside of our widget to be super long. Something you should also be noticing is that I was able to call this function directly upon after calling the set name function. And that's because most of these functions are chainable. So they return the icon itself which means you can chain functions on top of functions. So I can call another function here after modifying the theme and continue on the chain and just keep going on. So like I could set the name again to something different like hello, and then I can continue chaining to different functions that are inside of my widget. Now, another function we have is called modify child theme. And the documentation states that this will update the appearance of all icons that are parented to this icon. So using different things like menus and stuff like that, or changing around the parenting of widgets, you can go ahead and have some icons or widgets be a child of another icon. And then using this function, you can modify all of those particular icons and their themes with the same modifications that you would use in the regular modify theme function. So you would pass a table with the different properties you would like to change, or if you need to change multiple different properties, then you would pass multiple different tables in here. That would of course contain the name of the particular instance you wanna modify, the name of the property and the value you want to supply to that property. The next function that exists for widgets is a function called set enabled, which will simply determine if you want the icon to be displayed or not displayed. So if I pass false here, my icon is going to disappear from the screen and we won't be able to interact with it. And as you can see, no more icon exists in the top left. The next function we have here is select, which will allow you to artificially select the button without a player or a user needing to select it using their mouse or touching on the screen of a mobile device or whatever. We can select the widget automatically just by using this function. And as you can see, I have not clicked on my widget yet, but it's already selected. And when I click on it again, now it's going to deselect. Of course, this wouldn't be complete without having another function to deselect the widget without needing the user to deselect it manually. Another function we have is the ability to add notifications to our widget. So we can use the function notify to allow a little pop up on the top right of the widget to appear, displaying how many notifications there are. And we're also able to provide a custom clear signal, which means the notifications will disappear during some kind of signal. And this signal could be whatever, it could be an RBX script signal, it could be a custom signal from a custom module. Whenever that particular signal triggers, then it's going to clear the notifications. But let's just go ahead and create one notification. And as you can see, there is my widget with my notification. If I select it and then deselect it, it's going to automatically disappear once we have deselected the widget. But instead, if you wanted the notification to disappear when the, let's say the icon is selected, then we can refer to an event inside of our icon or our widget. And that event is called selected. And we're just going to pass that. So now if we go and play test the game, 
and we were to select it, as you can see, now the notification has already disappeared and we didn't need to deselect. And of course, we also have a function to clear any notices on the button as well if we wish to do so through scripts. The next function we have is called disable overlay. Ignore this other one called disable state overlay that's deprecated and it's simply there for backwards compatibility. But disable state overlay, if we go ahead and call that function, and if we pass a value like true and we go and play test the game, what you're going to notice is that the hovering or that little kind of effect when you hover over the button is now disabled. So as you can see, I can select it and deselect it. But when I was hovering over the widget earlier, you could see that the background color was changing. But now that we've disabled it, it doesn't do that anymore. Now let's add a little bit more personality to our widget. And we can do so by using a function called set image, which allows us to set an image onto our widget. So let's go ahead and open up the toolbox and let's find a suiting image to place inside of the widget. All right, so I found a suitable image ID. All you need to do is pass that ID to the set image function. And as you can see, now your widget should have that image inside of it. So there's my little shocked Freddy Fazbear inside of my icon. And you should also notice that the shape of it or the size of it has shrunk down and it's become basically a circle with my image in the center. We can also add text to our widgets by using the set label function and we can pass whatever kind of text that we want here. And let's say I only want this text to appear when I have the icon selected. So we're also able to pass an icon state to this function, which means it's only going to update the text label during that particular state. If we take a look at the documentation for icon states, it says sometimes you'll want an item to appear only when deselected and similarly only when selected. You can achieve this by specifying a string value within the icon state parameter of methods containing the toggleable tag. These are deselected, selected, and viewing. So we can pass these three different strings to determine when we would like certain things to happen on our label. So let's go ahead and set the label of hello there only once we have selected the widget. As you can see, there's no text currently on my widget, but once I have selected it, there we go, it says hello there. And then once I deselect it, that text automatically disappears. Now, sometimes if you have multiple different icons on, let's say the left-hand side of the screen, you might wanna shift around the ordering of the different icons. And in order to do that, there's a function called set order. And all you need to do is pass a number of the order for this particular icon. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to make a few more icons here and they're just going to be empty icons. And by default, all of these icons are going to be on the left-hand side. And let's say for my particular Bob icon here, I want it to be the last. So since there's four icons here, I'm going to set its order to a value of four. And as you can see now, my Bob widget is the last one inside of this chain of icons. If I want it to be the second one from the left-hand side, then I can set the order of this one to be two. But then we also need to adjust the ordering of these other icons because by default, they're all going to be in order of one. So this one will still end up at the very end. So let's also go ahead and set the order of, let's just do the set order of this one to like one. And then we can set the order of this one to three. And then let's set the order of this one to four. And as you can see, there are my icons in the correct one, two, three, four position. If you would like to be able to adjust the corner radius of your icon, you can go ahead and do so using the set corner radius function. And all you need to do is pass a UDEM here. So we'll do a new UDEM dot new. And let's say instead of there being a scale, let's let's make the radius very small with an offset of like five pixels. And let's say we also only want to apply this corner radius when let's say the icon is selected. As you can see, there's my widget, but once I select it, the corner radius has changed. And then if I deselect it, it goes back to normal. As you can see, there's a little bit of a bug here when you have it selected like that. It's kind of reverting when you hover over the button. That's a little bit of a bug that needs to be resolved. But as you can see, once I deselect it, it goes back to normal. And then when I select it, it goes back to that other corner radius that we set in the script. Now, let's say we don't like this widget being on the left hand side of the screen and we want to shift it over to the right hand side of the screen or maybe the center of the screen. Then we can use the align function and tell if we would like to align it to the left, the center or the right. And all we need to do is pass a string. So if I would like my icon to be in the center of the string, I just need to say center. And as you can see, my icon is now in the center of the screen. Or if I want to move it to the right side of the screen, then I can do so. I can pass right 
And there we go, my icon or my widget is on the right side of the screen. Very cool. Now let's say I want my icon to be on the right side of the screen, but I also want it to be wider because that little circle on the right side of the screen just isn't big enough for my taste. Well, there's another function we could use, which is set width. And we can go ahead and define the minimum offset in pixels for the width of this icon. The documentation states that the default width is 44, but let's go ahead and say we want it to be 200 pixels wide. And as you can see, now I have my widget that is 200 pixels across. Now, another issue is that my image inside of my icon is a little bit small. So what if I want to make it bigger? Well, we have another function, which is set image scale, which allows you to change the scale of the image. The default value is 0.5. So let's make our image twice as big by passing a value of one. And there we go, now I have a bigger Freddy Fazbear inside of my widget. Now maybe I want to stretch the image to fit the entire width of my icon. Well, there's another function. We can do set image ratio to change the ratio of the image. The default is one, which results in a perfect square. But if I would like to stretch it more, let me pass a value of like, let's say six. And as you can see, there's my Freddy Fazbear stretched across the entire widget with a ratio of six. If I would like to squish it in more, then I can pass a lower value than one. So I could pass a value of like 0.5 here. And there we go, now my image is nice and squished. Now let's say we had some text inside of our label, but we wanted to be able to change the size of that text. Well, we can use a function, which is set text size to do exactly that. And we can pass a number to whatever text size we want. So let's say we wanna set it to some text that's a little bit bigger. Let's try 40. As you can see, there is my widget with my small little image and my big old text that says, hello there. Now, maybe you don't like this particular font that is being displayed. Well, guess what? You can change the font as well using the set text font function. And here you can pass an enum. You could pass a font family name or you can pass a font family link using the RBX asset kind of uh, standard string. So you could do like RBX asset colon slash slash fonts and then define whatever family. But to make this easy, let's just go ahead and do enum.font and let's just pick out some kind of font in here. I don't know which one to do. Let's do, uh, actually let's do the new builder font. Yeah, there we go. Let's do Builder Sans Extra Bold. And there we go. Now I have my bolded Builder Sans text inside of my widget. Now the functionality doesn't stop there because what if I would like to be able to open another GUI element on the screen based on when this particular widget is toggled? Well, there is a function called bind toggle item where I can pass a GUI object or a layer collector. And a layer collector is just a GUI, so it could be a screen GUI or a surface GUI, whatever. And when my widget is toggled or enabled or selected or whatever, then it's going to also select that other GUI object. And then when I deselect my icon, it's also going to deselect that other GUI object. So here I have the screen GUI and starter GUI. Right now it's disabled, but when I enable it, it'll show this little stupid little text label on the screen. But let's go ahead and keep it disabled. And then let's pass that to this function as a particular layer collector that we would like to toggle when our icon is toggled. So I'll just make a variable for my GUI game, get service. I'll grab the player service, get my local player and then refer to my player GUI folder. And actually, let me just use wait for child on that just in case. And then now I can go ahead and pass my GUI to my widget. And now when I go to select my widget, what you're going to see is that the label appears on the screen. And then if I deselect, it also disappears. Now let's say sometime later in your game, you don't want to have this particular item toggleable anymore. Then you can use another function, which is going to be the unbind toggle item, where you could pass the same item again, and now it will no longer be toggled along with the icon. Widgets also have some events with them, so you can use the bind event function to bind to a particular icon event and pass a function that's going to execute when that event is triggered. If we take a look at the documentation for events, we have a selected event, we have a deselected event, we have a toggled event, a viewing started event, a viewing ended event, and a notified event. So these are the different events that we can go ahead and bind and listen to whenever they are triggered. So for simple demonstration, I'm just going to bind to, let's say the selected event, and I'm just going to pass my function here. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to print that uh, this icon was selected. So icon was selected. And now when I go and select my icon, as you can see, it printed that the icon was selected. And then I can deselect and then reselect it again. And it prints it once more inside of the console. 
Now it's important to note that this function does not return some kind of connection instance where you can disconnect it. If you need to be able to disconnect a function from a particular event, then you're going to have to use the unbind event function and just pass the particular event name, in this case that would be selected, to unbind this particular function from that event. Now the features don't stop there. We are also able to bind a toggle key that we can press to open up or basically select and deselect a particular widget. All we need to do is pass an enum.keycode and whatever key we would like to use to toggle this widget. So let's go ahead and do, let's say the Q key. And if I hover over my widget, what you're going to see is a little drop down caption appear showing us that we can press Q to basically select this widget. So if I go ahead and press Q on my keyboard, as you can see, it's selected. And then when I press it again, now it's deselected, which is pretty cool. And of course, if you don't want to have a particular key bound to your icon anymore, then you can just use the unbind toggle key function pass the particular key code that you want to unbind and you'll be good to go. Another function that we have for widgets is the call function. And this will allow you to pass a callback function here, which will get past the icon itself. But the cool thing about this is that this call function still returns the widget so you can continue your chain. The documentation states that this function is useful when you need to basically extend the behavior of an icon while remaining in this function chain. So just for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to print uh, this function was immediately called. And then if we go and play the game, what you're going to see in the console is that this function was immediately called. And then it also gets past the icon to it. So if you need to extend any other kind of functionality in here, you can go ahead and totally do that. Another function that we have for widgets is going to be the add to janitor function which allows you to basically pass anything here and that particular thing will get cleaned up when this particular icon is destroyed. So as an example, let's say I want to delete and clean up this green GUI when my icon gets destroyed. So I'm going to pass my GUI here and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's say, wait for five seconds and then I'm going to destroy this particular icon and I'm going to do that using the destroy function so we'll destroy the icon after five seconds, which should also destroy this GUI. Now I'm going to enable this GUI so we can see it on the screen. And I'm going to wait five seconds and my widget should disappear. There we go. It was added to the janitor. And then once the icon was destroyed, it got cleaned up by the janitor as well. Now let's say you wanted to be able to lock a widget from being interacted with. You wanna prevent the player from being able to click it, deselect it, whatever. Then you can go ahead and call the lock function, which will, as it says, lock the widget. And then if you need to unlock your widget to uh, re-enable user input to toggle the icon, then you can just simply call the unlock function. So as an example right now, my widget is locked. I can't interact with it, hovering over it with my mouse does nothing and I can't do anything. I can interact with these other widgets though because they are not locked. Now let's say you wanna be able to lock a widget for a particular time period. So we can call the debounce function and pass a certain amount of seconds that we would like to lock this particular icon for. So let's say we wanna lock it for five seconds. And then actually what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to delay a function for five seconds and then I'll just print out saying that the icon shouldn't be locked anymore. And then right now I can't interact with my particular widget, but we're going to be waiting five seconds. Or actually, you know what? I believe the function yield, which is why it didn't print. So yes, this function right here does yield, which is why this didn't execute first. So if you're going to be calling this debound function, it is going to yield your code. So if you were to continue calling along your chain, the next function wouldn't execute until this is done yielding. So we're going to wait for those five seconds and then it should print that it was unlocked. Okay, there we go. Icon shouldn't be locked anymore. The yield was over, which created the other widgets. And now I am able to select my icon again. Now, something interesting to note is that when you have multiple widgets on your screen, if you select one and then you go and select another one, that other widget automatically gets deselected. Now, sometimes this particular behavior may not be wanted. And don't worry, there is a function to disable that. That function is going to be the auto deselect and you can pass a Boolean if you would like to disable it. So the default is going to be true, but let's say for this particular icon, I do not want to have it deselected when another icon is selected. 
So as you can see, I can go ahead and select my icon and then I can select another one. And look at that, that widget is still selected. Now having selectable and deselectable widgets are cool and all, but let's say you just want a widget to act as a simple button. You can't select it, you can't deselect it. All you can do is just click on it. Well, you can use the one click function and pass a value of true here to convert your icon into a one click icon. And I can hover over my widget and I can click it and what you'll notice is that, well, it's not selecting my widget anymore. The next function we're going to take a look at is called set caption. So if you saw earlier, there was a caption that appeared underneath our widget when we selected or placed a particular toggle key on it. But let's say you don't want to show up some weird toggle key. Maybe you want to put some caption text. Well, that's what you can do with this function. I'll just say that this is an example caption. And now when you hover over your widget, as you can see, the caption appears and it says what we wanted. This is an example caption. We are also able to set the caption hint for a particular key code without necessarily needing to bind that key code to a widget. So let's say I liked the key code of Q appearing underneath of my widget, but I didn't actually want to bind, let's say Q to my widget. What you'll notice is that the Q caption appears underneath my widget, but if I press Q on my keyboard, nothing is happening because I didn't actually bind Q to my widget. Another function we're going to take a look at is the set dropdown function, which as the name suggests, allows you to create a dropdown for this particular icon and you can give it an array of icons that will act as children. So there'll be children of this icon inside of your dropdown. So for this example, I'm just going to pass an array and I'm just going to make a bunch of new icons in here. And when I go and select my widget, you're going to see my dropdown appear with my three empty icons, which is really cool. Now, let's say a little bit later, you had another icon that you wanted to be able to add inside of the dropdown, but without having to recall set dropdown again and redo all of the icons that are already inside of the widget. Well, you can easily do so with a function called join dropdown. So let's say with this icon right here, and then to be able to differentiate it, let me actually set a label on this. So I'll just say uh, hello, and then I'll get rid of that. And let's say we want to join this icon into the dropdown of this icon. Well, it's really easy to do. All we need to do is use a function called join dropdown, and we just need to pass it what icon is going to act as the parent for this icon. And that's going to be our icon variable. And now what you're going to notice is if I select this widget, as you can see, there we go. There's my other icon that has been joined into the dropdown of this icon. Now there isn't just dropdowns, but there's also menus that open up horizontally. So let's go ahead and call the set menu function to create a new menu on this icon. And again, we need to pass it an array of icons. So I'll just do icon.new, icon.new, and icon.new. And if I go ahead and select my widget here, there we go, it opened up with this menu and I have my three other icons inside of it that I can select and deselect and then I can hover back over to my X button and close out that menu. And of course, there's also a function for joining an icon into a menu. So if I would like to add this particular icon into the menu of this icon, then I can use the join menu function and pass the parent icon, which is going to be my icon. And as you can see, my hello icon has disappeared, but if I open up the menu, there is my hello icon. But let's say you had an icon joined into the menu or a dropdown of a, another icon, and you decide, you know what? I don't want it to be inside of there anymore. How can you do that? Well, there is another simple function, which is simply leave, and it will allow the icon to hop out or leave the menu or dropdown that it's inside of. And then last but not least, the final function that we saw earlier is the destroy function, which simply cleans up and destroys the icon. As we saw earlier, there are several different events that we can access inside of an icon. So there's going to be the selected event that we can go ahead and connect a function to. So let's just print selected here. And then we also have the deselected event. So deselected, let's connect a function to that. We have an event called toggled, which simply fires every single time the button is, you know, toggled or clicked. So that could happen when it's deselected or selected. It will fire every single time. We have another event called viewing started, which occurs when, let's say, the mouse hovers over the widget. And then, of course, there is a viewing ended event, 
And then last but not least, we have the notified event, which as the name suggests, will fire when the icon has a notification appears. And then down here, I'll just make a while loop that will, let's say every single second, add a new notification to the icon. And what you're going to see is that we've gotten a notification, new notification, and that'll keep happening every single second. As you can see, it's also incrementing on my widget. And as you can see, when I hover my mouse over the widget, it says mouse hovering over widget. And then when I leave, mouse is no longer hovering over the widget. If I go ahead and click it, we selected it, but we've also toggled it. And then when I click it again, we've deselected it and we've also toggled it. Icons also have some read only properties that you can go ahead and look at. One of those read only properties is going to be the name of the icon, which is what we would set using the set name function. We can also read whether or not this icon is currently selected with the is selected property. We can go ahead and read whether or not this icon is enabled with the enabled or is enabled property. We can read the total amount of notices using the total notices property. And we can also read if this icon is currently locked with the is locked, or I believe, is it just locked? I think it's just locked. So actually let's print icon.lock. And before we do that, let's go ahead and actually lock the icon. And if we run the game, there we go. It prints true because the icon is currently locked. Now we also have some other functions inside of the icon module itself. One of those functions is the ability to change the display order for the GUI that contains all of the icons on the screen. So we could call the function set display order and we pass a number to change the display order for that GUI. So let's say I wanna set the display order to five. And then I messed with another GUI to have basically this white frame cover the entire screen, including the GUI inset and its display order is set to zero. So if we go and play test the game, what you're going to see is that top bar still appears over it because it has a display order of zero while top bar has a display order of five. But if I were to have my screen GUI with a display order of six instead, what you're going to see is that top bar plus is no longer visible because this GUI is being rendered or drawn over top bar plus's GUI. Another function that we have inside of the icon module is the ability to change or set whether or not we want the entire top bar enabled or disabled for all of the icons. And that function is set top bar enabled and we need to pass it a Boolean. So let's say we wanted to hide all of the widgets created by this module on the top of the screen. Then we can go ahead and just pass false here. And that means we shouldn't be able to see this icon on the screen. And as you can see, no widgets or no icons are visible from top bar plus. And then the last function that we have inside of the icon module is a function called modify base theme, which is the exact same as the other modify theme functions where you need to pass a table containing the names, the properties and the values. But this function will go ahead and apply these changes to all icons made by the module. Now, one last thing I would like to mention with top bar plus is that if we go to the icon module and open it up, and we go to the features folder, there's going to be a module called themes. And inside of that module is where you're going to find the default theme for top bar plus. So if you ever wanted to modify the default theme and change up the color scheme or whatever, you can do so by modifying all of the different settings here inside of this default module. And as you can see, this module also follows the same format as what is expected for the modify theme functions. So it's literally just a table with other tables inside of it that contain the name of the instance that we want to modify, the name of the property, and then the value to apply to that property. And of course, if you always want to look at more examples of top bar plus, including some of the ones that are shown in this example gift here, then you can head over to the V3 playground. And here at the V3 playground, you can go ahead and hit the three dots and you can edit in studio and open up your own copy of some of the example work that Forever HD has made for top bar plus version three. And that's about everything with top bar plus. It's a very useful module to create widgets across the top of the screen that match the style of the new Roblox UI. I'm sure a lot of games will be using this new version three, just like how a lot of games use the previous version two. A huge thank you to Forever HD for making this sweet module and a big thank you to you, the viewer. The link to this dev forum post for top bar plus version three will be in the description. So go ahead and check it out and I will see you next time.